All right, hello everyone. So today we have Dr. Ella Adkins here. She is a professor at the University of Michigan's Aerospace Engineering Department, where she directs the Autonomous Aerospace Systems Lab and is the Associate Director of the Robotics Institute. Uh, Dr. Adkins holds a BS and MS degrees in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT and an MS and PhDs in computer science and engineering from the University of Michigan. She is the past chair of AIAA's Intelligent Systems Technical Committee and the AIAA Associate Fellow, an so IEEE senior member, and a small public airport owner operator and a private pilot, Part 107 UAS pilot. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. How many of you are in aerospace? Yeah. All right. How many of you are in robotics? Okay. Computer science? Mechanical? What did I miss? Ele oh, yeah. <laughs> electrical. There are just too many electricals, but not here. All right. So uh, my background is in both aerospace and computer science. Uh, when I became a faculty member uh, several years ago, I moved from a computer science PhD into aerospace where I quickly learned that most of the students were more interested in physics-based models than in state machines, complexity, real-time systems, and the other things I'd learned in computer science. So there are many years where I kind of tried to go back and say, what is the link? What is the commonality between uh, what we do for uh, traditional aerospace, which is looking at <coughs> physics-based models, and what we do for computer science, which I was in AI and real-time systems, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, cognitive modeling, uh, decision modeling, and uh, paying attention to the computational resources and their limitations that comes into that. So one of the things that struck me very early on is that uh, we're really not exploiting opportunities to, in an offline fashion, process, learn, parse data so that we have new sources of information that are compact and efficient to access online in aerospace systems. So that's where the title to this talk came from because one of the things that as I've now kind of transitioned from having aerospace students to having robotics students, Finally, after all these years, my students have the background that they need to be successful with the machine learning, with the AI, with the, 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 the backgrounds that they need to have to study <coughs> how to make flight safer with data. So I start out with a slide that may seem pretty basic, but I like to put it up because when one uses the word autonomy, uh, people can mean at least half a dozen different things. Uh, so what is autonomy uh, from the dictionary, the first line, the quality or state of being self-governing? So what distinguishes automation from autonomy, in automation, one does a repetitive process and maybe does it quite well, but there's never the notion that the autonomy is in charge. There's the notion that someone has programmed within a set of constraints uh, instructions for something to do uh, work, perhaps in an assembly line, uh, or an autopilot system, and then the software does it over and over again. And so this is not me saying this is the absolute definition, and I would prefer a discussion to just kind of telling you what I think. So jump in anytime. Right, so then the other lines on this slide, right? So the idea, bottom line is, there's learning involved because if one doesn't know what to do, whether they're a synthetic agent or a human, they need to learn. And the second thing is there has to be the ability to handle contingencies. What happens when something is not exactly the way you expected it to be? So any arguments here? I know I'm disturbing you from lunch. Please jump in later. Right, so we want to be able, when we move from having human supervised, human controlled vehicle and other robotic systems, to having autonomous systems that we set loose and they do what it is that they're going to do, we need to be able to handle rare or even unmodeled events. When you say unmodeled, it's pretty scary, right? What happens if you don't have a model, right? You have to get one. Because software is not gonna know what to do any better than a human if you have no model whatsoever to match. How do you adapt to changes in the environment, the mission, the platform? How do you take data that is communicated to you or sensed directly from the environment and 
make good use of it. And then once you have these capabilities, which can be pretty scary because there's always the possibility of learning bad things, of pulling in bad data, having security problems, the list is very long. How do you get to the point where you have safety and trust? All right, so I'm going to talk about three different research projects today that my group has been working on for some time. The first is in emergency flight planning. Uh, that is really at the core of looking at a situation where you're in the air and it's a bad deal. Whether you're a manned aircraft or an unmanned aircraft, if you're in a car, you stop. If you're in the air, you have to land, right? You can't just stop. So this is a long-standing challenge for every pilot that's ever flown, and it's a long-standing challenge for all software that's ever tried to help. Next, flight safety assessment and management. Well, uh, let me tell you what I mean by that, because that could have many different meanings. What I mean by that is that you have a watchdog. In computer science, a watchdog tries to see problems with very simple monitors, right? So maybe you're not getting a, a ping from a sensor. Uh, in this case, it's quite a lot more complicated than that, so we don't call it a watchdog. What we're looking at is for safety violations in a flight <coughs> management system on an aircraft, which today is a combination of a human pilot and fairly sophisticated automation, but not autonomy. Right, so if you put those two together, you can have problems sometimes. And it could be the fault of the pilot, it could be the fault of the software, it could be the fault of the sensors, it could be some combination of those, or some hardware or environmental challenge. Uh, and this module aims to monitor that. Notice when there are safety violations and take over and recover. There are some of these systems that have been put into aircraft, like a notable example, Airbus has a flight envelope protection system that prevents the pilot from stalling the aircraft. Right? This is looking at a general purpose capability, which is having automation or autonomy, I guess I would say in this case, override a flight crew without the possibility that the crew could in turn override this automation. Scary. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's uh, why it's an important research problem, I think. Um, so we'll get there, and then finally I'll talk a little bit about geofencing. We're at a very exciting time where we're thinking about new vehicles with wings and 14 to 20 motors carrying people from place to place and uh, burritos being delivered by uh, um, small drones. Uh, and so we have to make sense of the airspace. All right, so uh, one of the things that I've always used as a source of data is the accident dockets from the NTSB. Many years ago, you had to write a letter and request through the Freedom of Information Act uh, <coughs> information about specific accidents, and it would take months. Now the accident information, at least in US-related accidents, is available online. You can download black box <coughs> data, reports, everything immediately when you want to. Uh, so <coughs> there's two classes of uh, examples that you tend to find in aviation. Uh, the ones on the left are the good behaviors. Play, times when the pilots had done things that were clever and successful, and the ones on the right are when pilots have done bad things. So these are pretty simple in the sense that if you look at the left, these are cases where pilots have successfully emergency landed different classes of airplanes and everyone was okay. The top left one was Sully in the US Airways flight. The bottom left one, is uh, one of many examples of where a general aviation plane ran out of fuel. Same thing as if the engine failed. And in this case, the pilot landed on the Cross Bronx Expressway in the middle of New York City. And it was uh, extremely lucky. There was a construction crew. They saw the plane coming down. They stopped the traffic. The guy landed. Uh, so this was lucky. But my question in this is, how could we capture this in a way where data to decisions can be effective? On the right. That really is motivating this notion of monitoring the behavior of the pilots and stopping things where the nominal behaviors are not a good idea. And kind of what I, what I want to, to say, the middle one is a drone flying into the wrong place, so that motivates the geofencing. But if we look at what happened on 9-11, we have planes that were intentionally flown into buildings. And there's no excuse for that. Right? We never ever, no matter what the situation is, want to give the pilot the authority to fly into a building. So the reason that autonomy override of humans is not at all scary is because if you limit this override to cases where people will die, 
it's the only way we can make flying not scary. Bottom right, German wings flight. One of the things that was done after 9-11 to protect passengers was to put a lock on cockpit doors, which prevented passengers from coming up front. That caused the bottom right crash, right? Because in this case, the pilot, who presumably was a good guy, the co-pilot, who was a bad guy, uh, ended up in a situation where the pilot went to the restroom, the co-pilot locked that door, and flew the plane into the mountain while the pilot was banging on the door saying, please let me in, right? The software could have stopped that. We know how to do it. It's a system called Auto GCAS, Auto Ground Collision Avoidance System, and it already flies in military airplanes. But it doesn't fly in commercial transport aircraft because it would be expensive to put in the passengers don't demand it, and therefore the airlines don't demand it in their products. But if that were transitioned from a proven military system that's flying right now to prevent planes flying under the radar from being dr driven into mountains, it would stop all of this type of accident. And that is perhaps the most compelling reason to have auto autonomy override of humans. So Karen, feel free to jump in and argue with me anytime. You know where I'm going in this presentation. I do. <laughs> Listen to her th enthusiasm, yeah. All right, so uh, we'll talk later. So a lot of what we've done over the years has fit within a broader architecture of contingency management in a next generation autonomy system for aircraft. Right, so here we have uh, the whole loop, right? So on the right, you have the aircraft, if something happens to the aircraft that changes its performance, maybe you have ice on the wing, maybe you have uh, part of the structure failing, maybe you have a control service or engine failure, then from control theory, we have techniques to identify the new dynamics of the system, to estimate what the flight envelope is, that's your performance limits that you can use in decision making, and then also to adapt the controller to a new form, either by recalling from a database a controller that was designed, for example, for a control surface jam or an engine failure. You don't have to learn online for that, right? You can have a pre-certified control system that handles <coughs> the case, for example, of rudder jam, right? That is not scary to the FAA as long as you have a deterministic solution that has gone through the same certification process as the regular non-adaptive flight management system, right? I just want to point that out because there's a whole family of recovery techniques that are not in these planes today that could be, that could go through the standard certification process. Same for self-driving cars. Different topic though. So then uh, the adaptive planning and guidance, that's kind of where my group has, let, has lived with emergency flight planning. One of the things as a pilot early on that one appreciates is if you're in trouble in the air, you want to land. Right, we're not talking about a military mission where there's a trade-off between continuing and crashing versus turning back and being safe. If you're just transporting people from place to place, you want to land, right? There's no, no debate in that. You want to be safe. You want to get out of the airplane and walk on the ground again. So what that means is that this adaptive planning and guidance box in a contingency situation where you want to land becomes emergency flight planning. So this slide comes from about 2001. One of the first things I did as a young assistant professor was take my experiences of being scared as a pilot and liking autonomy as an AI student into emergency landing planning. So the first step was to take the best data that pilots have, which is the aviation databases, right? We have known runways, they don't move. And they tend to be clear as long as the airports are open. Right, so if you take the runways from an airport database, you have a whole list of landing sites. Most of the airports, especially the bigger ones, have wind estimates, so you can get headwind, tailwind, crosswind. Uh, you also know what facilities are there, so you have a whole list of information for each and every runway. Each airport will have at least two runways, the one going both directions, and an airport such as Atlanta has a whole list of runways. Uh, so if you take that list, then you have to meet constraints. Is it long enough? Is the wind okay? Um, is the visibility sufficient with the instrumentation that you have there? So you end up 
once you meet the constraints with the ability to prioritize by a multi-objective cost function the runways so that the system can say, this one's best, right? I think if something happened right above Georgia Tech, you would choose one of the Atlanta airport runways, one of the Hartsfield uh, airport runways because they're very long and very wide. And one of the tricks in aviation is, I'm not gonna talk about detect and avoid at all because anytime you have an emergency that you declare, it is the job of air traffic control and the other pilots to get out of the way. So the best solution then is for the autonomy to calculate the plan in a millisecond and broadcast this plan through data link to everybody in the system. And then the only thing the other planes have to do is stay out of the way. Okay, so I, it's possible that I won't get the right one. Yeah, so the first case that we did was around the San Francisco area, and my software chose Sacramento. <coughs> right, so, I, yeah. Sometimes the military airports are longer, yeah. and if you put in any sort of congestion factor, then you would probably right. get that one. Yes? Would the software be able to choose creative solutions, like landing on the Hudson? Hey, you... <laughs> Ask exactly the right question. I love your question. We'll get there. You know what my next slide is? No kidding. Thank you. So uh, this was uh, kind of, uh, so we did that other slide in 2001. Uh, the Hudson River case happened in 2009. So this provided an absolutely ideal data set because one knows the glide performance of an airplane. That's something that you know in aerospace. It's part of the model. It's not something you have to learn online. So having engine out failures is probably mathematically the easiest thing you could possibly do with this emergency flight plan planning uh, case. So we took this. Actually, I did this in my office. It was great fun. I spent an all-nighter taking black box data and plotting it and running my software. It was wonderful. Um, but, you know, it's only a conference paper because this is not new research. This is me taking Hudson River <coughs> landing data and putting my model with it. Uh, so this was the flight tra track that was followed. Um, the pilot took off from LaGuardia, climbed out, normal climb out, hit birds. About where you see that black square at the top is where the engine failed, probably about two time points earlier. The reason these <coughs> points are so far apart is because the black box data was only recorded every four seconds. The GPS was only recorded every four seconds. So instead of interpolating, this is basically just plotting the exact points that were found in the black box data recorder. So um, we ran the flight planner. The, you know, the, the flight planner itself ranked the nearby runways and used a geometric uh, Dubbins planner, which is basically a turn fly turn strategy minimum length. Uh, and what it found is that if you started the return to LaGuardia within four seconds, there were actually three different runways that were reachable. If you waited for eight seconds, only two of the runways were reachable. If you waited 12 seconds, only one way, runway was reachable. And if you waited longer than that, no runways were reachable. So if you look at the, you know, the movie has good and bad points. But if you actually pay attention to what was said in the cockpit voice recorder, air traffic control transcripts, there's a dialogue that goes on. This is the most motivational example for data link that I've ever heard. Because in this case, a data link would have made the system aware that the engines had failed on this aircraft in less than a second. It took over 20 seconds for Sully to speak with a very well-qualified air traffic controller who was doing their job and managed to convince him that indeed there had been a double bird strike and that the engines had failed. So what that meant is that in the time that they had to come back to the runway, there was chatter on a voice link that prevented Sully from being able to turn around. Now the second thing that came out from this is that when interviewed, testifying I guess it was called, later, um, people asked him, hey, these pilots in a simulator were able to land at LaGuardia, what happened? Why didn't you do it? Are you a bad pilot, right? And you know, it's never a kind environment when you're testifying, I think. And so he said, well, you know, I, did, I wasn't sure. Right? I knew I could make the Hudson. I wasn't sure that I could go back to LaGuardia. Well, this is the math that we're actually really good at with simple code. Yet it doesn't exist on any commercial aircraft today. 
This is not machine learning, right? This is nothing fancy, right? Yeah, go ahead. Now, the Hudson is pretty long. I don't know what, I just, I've just destroyed your podium, but I don't know why. Anyway, yeah. If, if you take the Hudson as a viable runway, though, I mean, it's a, it's a dicey proposition, clearly. Um, but would my guard, I mean, this, these are very tight constraints. Mm -hmm. So the Hudson might have been viable for a much longer time. Yeah, so, so the Hudson was viable for a longer time, but if you look at the risk of the landing site to the people on board the aircraft, the Hudson was extremely high risk. Whereas coming back on a known glide flight path to LaGuardia, given that the crew knew that the control surfaces were working okay and in fact needed those same control surfaces for the Hudson, uh, the only thing that was more risky about going back to LaGuardia was uh, flying over the densely populated area between where the plane had to turn around and LaGuardia. So if something else had happened to the airplane, they might have landed in the neighborhood. Whereas Sully was flying primarily over the water, although it was interestingly enough, if you look at the data, there is a bit of a blip right there in the middle, which is fascinating because this was where he saw a bridge. Right, and it was like, oh, I, <laughs> it was just natural reaction to do that, right, which actually made him not glide as far. Now, it didn't matter, right? He would came down in the river, and that was the best choice that he had. But the reason he needed to make that choice was because of the voice-based air traffic control and the lack of geometry in code on the aircraft, right? Otherwise, he could have had that confidence that he needed to turn back. All right, so where did this go? later, right? This, this basically was not really you know, publicized all that well because I think the research community said, well, this is too simple, what's next? And indeed it was simple, but the reason I spend time on it still now after all these years is because emergency landing planning is also the key to urban air mobility and unmanned aircraft systems flying safely at low altitude over urban centers like Atlanta. So now we have a new motivation Whereas with the commercial transport aircraft, you get a Hudson River kind of situation once every many flight hours, many is large. Uh, in the case of the unmanned aircraft, the statistics are not nearly as high. The same with general aviation and helicopters. So where we've gone to now is looking more broadly and acknowledging that if you're flying low over a city, you're not in fact going to be able to reach a runway. So we want other data sources. Uh, so most of the research in this area has focused on real-time sensor data processing on board the vehicles. So suppose you had a helicopter that had radar and vision sensors. You can fuse that data. You can look uh, at the uh, range that those sensors provide data for. And if there is a safe landing site in that area, you can select it and go there. Um, fine. What my group has been focusing on more of is could we use all the other data that's available to us? to build compact, easily accessed databases for use in real time on the vehicle to give the vehicle the same kind of comprehensive understanding of the area that a very well-trained pilot who's flown in that area all their life might have, if not better. That's the sta static databases. The problem with the static databases, of course, is that the data may be outdated, outdated meaning there may be cars, people, and other things that are not actually in your databases, so you need to be able to capture dynamic events as well as <clears throat> long-term data. So to deal with the fact that most people, when they think of emergency landing using sensor data, are thinking of sensors carried on board the vehicle, I offer this kind of more modern flowchart to complement the one you saw previously. On the right-hand side of this slide, when you have some kind of problem and you need to do an emergency landing, it says failure here, that could be generalized. Then the basic question that you want to ask is, is the local area safe for a landing? If the answer is yes, use your sensors, land, and you're done, right? Because that gets you out of the sky as soon as possible and it's safe. If the answer is no, rather than trying to land in an unsafe area or guess what direction to go next where you might sense a safe area, but you don't actually know, use the maps, use the data that you could get in advance to know where to go and then execute the plan to that safe area. All right, so this is what we've been using. Combination of raw data from satellites, airplanes that have created geographic information system data, 
which give you LIDAR that's really pretty good in most cities. And there's some coverage in other areas as well. Get, it's getting better year to year. Uh, census data, terrain data. So if you take all of that data, process it in advance, because you don't want a, a small UAV to be doing this with a beagle bone online, uh, then you end up being able to build constraints and cost functions for both the landing sites and the area that you would be flying over to get to those landing sites. That in turn allows you to calculate and optimize to minimize the risk of a path flying over a particular urban center and also the risk and cost of landing at each site that you've identified as a candidate for landing. So where we started, taking open street maps, finding roads as landing sites. So this is motivated by the many pilots who've been successful landing on roads. They're pretty big. If you take away all the overpasses, power lines, and other obstructions that, are, that can be labeled and put on a, a map, then what you have are roads that have arbitrary um, structure to them as far as the plane is concerned. So then it's a matter of finding straight lines, eliminating anything that has obstructions, and using those as landing sites. So this top right map shows the area in New York near where that plane landed on the Cross Bronx Expressway. And what's shown are straight road segments with no obstructions. They are directional because you want to land in the direction of traffic. You never want to land into opposing traffic. That's a bad deal, not safe. So the idea here, if you just have this data and nothing else, is you would come down and you would be surprised by the traffic, but you at least would know where the straight segments of roads are. Uh, now imagine that you also combine this, and we have not done this because we don't have real-time access to this data yet, with traffic data. Right? So if you imagine the vehicle to cloud to vehicle data set being also available to the aircraft, then you actually could enter for emergency landing from the sky the same way an autonomous car would enter an on-ramp. And if you do that, your risk is bought down to something that is really quite low. Now, it makes a terrible mess for traffic later, right? Because your airplane is not just going to keep driving at 55 or 70 miles an hour. It's going to stop, and so is everything behind it. But nobody dies. Well, so the idea is that this would be stored on the vehicle, right? Because roads don't move. And, uh, well, some of it is stored on the vehicle, but some of it you're supplementing with more real Yeah, so if we have traffic data and that went out, then we would look at long-term statistics on traffic density and time of day. Okay. Uh, so this would also be something that would work very well in rural areas, right? Where pilots have been way more successful statistically than Cross Bronx Expressway are in Arizona and New Mexico and other places where you have long straight roads and very little traffic. So this still provides long straight segments for those landing sites as well. So that motivates not just looking at roads, but also looking at other landing sites. So for fixed wing airplanes that need a runway, roads are a good choice. Waterways can also be used, but they're not as desirable because you know that you're going to land in water and you can flip the plane very easily right? and eventually sink if you don't get out in time. Right? So for the small UAS now, Instead of roads, you don't really want a quadcopter to snarl traffic in the middle of Manhattan, right? So instead, what you'd rather have are other options for landing sites. So with open street maps, you can get different fields, like brown fields and other open areas that don't have build buildings in them. So if you take those, still identify landing sites, then the question is, what's next? So this heat map shows how you can minimize <coughs> risk to people by flying over minimally populated areas. So traditionally, people have used census data, which is static over a long term. And you can build a heat map of occupancy for that and fly over the homes, or fly not over the homes, fly over the areas that have the minimal number of homes where people live. That's great during the night. It's not great during the day because people go to work. So this is a heat map of Milan, Italy. And the reason that was chosen is that my student found an open database for a totally different competition of calls over a two-month period in 2008. And he looked at the patterns of where the people were based on the phone uh, call detail reports. And so what he found, you, you, you can watch the people go into the city for the workday. You can watch them leave. You see people disappear at night. 
because they turned their phones off. So he devised a multi-objective cost function that balanced census occupancy risk with mobile phone usage risk and applied a time of day filter to weight one versus the other. This allows one to build flight plans that are sensitive to flying over areas not expected to have people. Welcome to Michigan Stadium, a fine place. So this was a snarl or a kind of a hiccup in what he was doing with his research. Uh, part of the uh, data was a day that there was a World <coughs> Cup soccer event in Milan, Italy. And so uh, he, he, he being a fan of soccer as well as uh, being a good researcher, uh, looked at what happened to the cell phone data on that day. Well, it turns out what happened was that uh, you could watch everybody go into the stadium, very densely populated with the call detail reports, and then during periods of high activity, it looked like nobody was there, right? Because nobody was using their phones, right? So what this pointed to is that you need a better model, right? You can't look at instantaneous data. You have to look at trends over time. Since we hadn't seen the people leave the stadium yet, it meant that they probably were still there because you could see them later, like during breaks in the action and when they went home. <coughs> so I'm now moving on to another source of data that we had. So we took the vision and the LIDAR and processed it with the multi-stage machine learning algorithm. So yes, the machine learning is coming in here. Uh, so used a CNN at the first layer, which was pre-trained and compared different versions of these networks. Uh, used a uh, random forest uh, um, strategy as a second stage. So the idea here is they were classifying roofs and finding flat roofs. Because if you're flying small UAS in a city and you have to do an emergency landing, much better than to land in a community park with a soccer game or on a street is to land on a flat roof because the probability of it being occupied is very low. So this shows Witten, Germany, and the reason Witten, Germany was chosen <laughs> was because there was somebody who actually manually had gone into open street maps and classified all the roof shapes. Uh, good for them, but made it nice for the student. And so he had pre-classified data that he could use to train his neural network with. Uh, he did some double checks, right? So you find bounding boxes for the buildings, put all of the LIDAR data. He did a LIDAR set, he did a vision set, and he did a fused set where there was both vision and LIDAR data going into the two-stage network um, and found that actually uh, one can classify these roofs quite accurately. Uh, we have a paper submitted now that is looking at Manhattan, Witten, Germany, and then using a network trained on those two diverse areas. The, bu the building rooftop shapes are very different. Witten, Germany has the gabled roofs. It's a small community. Manhattan has flat roofs with complex structures like water towers on them. So uh, then uh, we used the pre-trained network for those two cities in Ann Arbor and showed that we could get nearly 100% accurately accuracy. It's 99 plus percent for finding flat roofs as long as you eliminate things that are uncertain. And so we had to add complex as a roof shape type. So what does that do? Well, what that does then is it allows us now to trade off, let me go back to that slide real quick, the risk of a landing site, which has to do with the size of the site and the probability that it's occupied with the risk of the path to get to that site. The path risk will go up as you have to fly farther and over more people. The landing site risk is a function of that site itself. So you end up with a Pareto front. Ideally, you're going to choose one that balances those two risks. So we have a weighted cost function that we would have in our autonomy software. This would be something that I think would be discussed in a community that was greater than just my student and me. Okay, so this is showing. So he also developed a heuristic that made a discrete search reasonably fast because it bounded the amount of expansion in the tree. So the tree was quite narrow going from top to bottom and uh, was able to show that uh, in, let's call it not a millisecond, but in, on the order of seconds, um, well, on the order of one second, a path can be found with discrete search that uh, allows one to minimize that combination of risk factors. All right, um, now is where I ask if there are any questions, and I think I have about 20 minutes, is that right? 115 is the goal? Okay. Questions, comments on this? This is my most long-standing work. Yeah, uh-huh. 
Well, there's this other movie where the guy flew upside down. Oh, I hate that movie. I <laughs> love Denzel Washington, but I yeah. hate that movie. Yeah. All of the aerodynamicists were angry, <laughs> right? Because there's something called an asymmetric airfoil. <sighs> Sorry, breathing deeply, right? So. <laughs> He was like, oh, if I turn upside down, it'll be awesome. Well, first of all, if you're flying knife edge, you're not getting a lot of lift, so you're falling a lot faster. The second thing is, if you're upside down in an airplane that has an asymmetric airfoil, you're not getting as much lift as if you were right side up, because the wing is designed to hold you up, but not really be an aerobatic airplane. Um, so that wasn't really well done, in my opinion. Are you talking about the movie or the pilot? <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, maybe, maybe my third issue, which I expect Karen shares with me, is that a drunk pilot may not fly better than a sober pilot. <laughs> and in that particular movie, it showed him drinking before he performed that heroic, life-saving feat that was physically unrealistic. Yeah. So, any other things you'd like me to express my opinion on? <laughs> the, there was a technical question in there. It was only implied. But the technical question was, it might not just be... You know, there might be with different control surfaces that are jammed, you might have to do no. other things and just glide. Yeah, so that's why uh, one, if one is actually using that flight management architecture that I showed, uh, rather than adapting online, which is something that's hard to certify, you would look at the flight performance characteristics, the flight envelopes, in advance with all of the different control surface jams. I actually had a couple of students that studied rudder jams, aileron jams, and elevator jams at different angles and drew flight envelopes for a particular Canada aircraft. And in one case, maybe the most fascinating case, which led to one of my PhD students' dissertations, the aileron jam caused the plane to not be able to turn one direction or fly straight. So it could only turn left, right? A severe jam, you could achieve a steady flight state, but it couldn't turn or fly straight, uh, except left turns. So what that meant, you had some flexibility, you could vary your turning radius, right? So that was a fascinating geometry problem, right? Where your flight plan, which is something that a computer can calculate if you've thought about it in advance, but something that both a human and optimal control would have a lot of trouble with online without knowing the form of the solution in advance, is to adjust the turning radius so that you actually could hit the runway. what has happened to the aircraft and what the aircraft's now current capabilities are. Yeah, and yeah. It's like the one really good useful place would be to say, like we actually have lost engines. I mean, it's, it's pretty common that if you think you've lost an engine before you shut that engine down, somebody goes and looks out a window to see if there's smoke coming out the engine because we've turned, shut down many fully functioning engines on accident. Well, so I think uh, in, in um, being blunt, which you would expect from me, I think automation is much better at that than human pilots, right? Because um, you have so much feedback. Each jet engine these days has a FADEC, full authority digi digital engine controller that has a thousand or so sensors in each engine. The probability that you'll shut down the engine that has all of those sensors reporting normal, uh, but no, that's that the one that's failed. Be like the combination things, like so when yeah. you lost all the hydraulics well, yeah, so uh, uh, we also have feedback from sensors that are directly measuring the deflection of control surfaces. I think the ones that are hardest are icing and structural problems because those are the ones that we can't have a database for in advance. And I think for those, the argument is, are you better off having an adaptive controller, which you, in all seriousness, do need for those cases, versus having the ability for the pilot to look out the window and take over and you know, wrestle the controls. I have a lot of friends who would claim that adaptive control will outperform humans in that situation. Um, I have other friends who claim that that might not be the case. <laughs> so, I mean, I think in those situations it's very hard. And from my perspective of higher level flight planning, what I would say, and this was something that the flight safety assessment and management was looking at, is that you override a crew that's flying into bad icing conditions before they've accumulated so much ice that you have heroic measures necessary just to maintain stability of the aircraft. So I think the, the whole idea is that if you capture something that's going to happen early enough that the flight performance hasn't changed, 
then you can begin whatever it is, whether it's a simple turn back to good weather or a full emergency landing sequence, then you can get down before it's really a bad situation. That's not always true, right? If you have uh, damage from a missile or from some kind of massive structural failure and uh, the plane the simply can't. Well, again, I would say that that's something that you wouldn't program into your autopilot, but you would have to watch for that, right? So if you have some kind of oscillation that is induced by the uh, um, autopilot trying to keep a straight nose, then uh, yeah. yeah, either pilots or autopilots can do that kind of thing. And so I guess I would say that this FSAM would override in the case that you were overstressing the structure as well because it would see that that was an exit from the flight envelope. All right, so I don't have much time for this. Um, let me ask you a question. Would you rather see this autonomy override or geofencing in the remaining 15 minutes? And this forces at least one or two of you to say something. Geofencing. Geofencing. All right, so I'm going to skip all of this. I'm only one voice. Anybody else? Geofencing. Geofencing. <laughs> all right, even though there was a scandal with pilot error right there, we'll skip by that. And, an, and, and a plane running, that's the most beautiful picture of a trajectory I've ever seen, right? You can tell the trajectory of the aircraft by looking at where there's no snow. All right, so this is a picture of the cartoon that NASA shares that shows about the different classes of airspace and where UTM, UAS traffic management, is expected to be um, in control. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with this, I'm just showing you this because it gets the discussion started. So suppose you buy into this and you say that all of these new vehicles, whether they're 14 motor manned transports from rooftop to rooftop or tiny burrito delivering drones, are going to share the bottom 400 feet of the airspace over urban centers. And the reason that this really constrained box has been proposed <coughs> is because that lets all of the other traffic operate undisturbed. Yeah, I, that, this is not mine. This is NASA's, and FAA likes it, and Amazon is all over it, and so forth. So uh, for me, what this means is that you have a really complex, highly contested space that needs to be organized. So there's this notion of geofencing, where a geofence is basically a box of airspace that has been allocated for a particular company or a particular aircraft to occupy for some period of time. For example, if you are away from an urban center, if you want to inspect a power line, if you're a power company and want to do that, you would uh, basically call in and say, I want this geofence over the power line. I'm going to start here. I'm going to end here. Box is formed. The central box is the airspace that if someone comes in there, they might hit you. Uh, so it's your keep-in geofence, meaning you're supposed to stay in that box. It is everybody else's keep-out geofence because they might conflict with you if they enter that box. Um, there's also an extended geofence box around this, which deals with the FCC problems, right? So your radio transmissions, your communications are not just constrained to the airspace that you occupy, but they go outside that airspace by some amount. So that's a really simple and nice... Um, way to manage traffic if you're in a rural area where there are infrequent operations because you have these big boxes, you keep everybody separate, it's a happy time. Now if you're in a city and you have quadcopters, survival flights, uh, and these UAM vehicles, plus others, trying to share the airspace, they have different performance characteristics and things are not going to be quite those, that simple. So most of the proposed geofencing work simply doesn't work. Right now, you can buy a DJI quadcopter, and it'll say, I ha we have geofencing. What do they mean by that? What they mean by that is that they won't fly if you're near the White House lawn or other restricted airspace. They'll not take off. They'll maintain this 400-foot ceiling, but you can trick it out because if you go to the top <coughs> of the mountain and you launch it from there, it'll fly over the valley up to 400 feet above the top of the mountain. Right? So there are ways to get around it. Right? They have two protocols for dealing with a violation. One is hover in place and the other is return to base. There's a wonderful YouTube video where these people, totally illegal, were on the, the side, beside a glass building and they set a home waypoint on the other side of the glass building. They took off, turned their transmitter off. The thing was returning to home and it hit the glass building and so they did that several times to show that it wasn't learning. 
I'm amazed their vehicle lasted. They picked it up, changed the propeller, kept going. But uh, the bottom line is we need a lot of research in this area because this is an unsolved problem and it is not addressed <coughs> by an incremental improvement in any existing airspace management policy that the FAA has ever written down or discussed. Do you agree with that? Okay, thank you. So we're getting a small start by looking at complex geofences that are in their most general form and we're looking at the mathematics of how to define them, how to layer them so that you have a warning boundary, and how to interface that both with the flight management or autopilot system on the vehicle and within the UTM environment. <clears throat> so uh, where do we start? Well, let's have a data structure. So we have a geofence list that any local UTM hub would maintain. This geofence list would be a combination of things that were always in place, like military airspace or the White House, plus dynamic geofences that were generated by entities that requested to fly. So the minimum that you need is to define the volume of the geofence, including a floor and a ceiling. Maybe it's constant. There's even some, some controversy over what floor and ceiling mean. I'll get to that with one slide. Uh, and then. UAS that are permitted in that geofence. It could be not just for one vehicle, but for a family of vehicles that have the ability to coordinate their operations that could share that volume. And then also that volume could have a trajectory. So in its most general form, you're not just looking at a box that is stationary. This also connects to the notion of the tube around a commercial transport. So the idea then would to be to have a general structure that you can apply to any situation, ranging from military or White House airspace that never moves, all the way up to a vehicle doing a long duration <coughs> transit. Also handles cooperative control, because you can have multiple vehicles in a volume. Uh, well, not exactly, because it abstracts away from the details of each individual vehicle. Right, so the vehicle could be doing some kind of coverage path or search and rescue or whatever it was, as long as it remained in that volume, then UTM wouldn't need to know what its flight plan was. And it could be more or less generous depending on the demand of the airspace. Uh, right, so then UTM would be responsible for denying <coughs> or terminating or adding new geofences. The aircraft couldn't just do it itself. I that would. Yeah. Versus as the airspace becomes more constrained, you could get it tighter and tighter. Well, uh, so yes and no. So again, we're, we're looking at the boxes. Yeah. We're not looking at the vehicles. No, so what that would mean to us is that you'd need to layer the boundary in so that the vehicle would have to turn back within a margin such that uncertainty in its ability to navigate and follow a flight plan would fall within that smaller region. But then once it was in that smaller region, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, so uh, the different types, I'm not going to talk about any equations, are static versus dynamic, right? Static would be fixed GPS coordinates, fixed volume. Dynamic, it follows the vehicle or group of vehicles. And then dy dynamicism could be in terms of duration, but it doesn't move, or trajectory, meaning that it moves over time. So this is, uh, I'm going to skip this because I've looked at my watch. So in the most general form, most people who have talked about geofences have talked about rectangles and squares. You could have anything, right? One of the things that I'm a big fan of is looking at land use type, which is something that the FAA doesn't do, but they need to if everybody's flying under 400 feet. What that means is that you could have arbitrary concave polygons that would intersect if you allowed all of them to exist. So the logic of handling all possible cases of arbitrary intersecting polygons, some of which you can occupy by permission and some of which you can't, has to be folded into this geofence permissions algorithm in a computationally efficient way. So we've been studying geometry again, which I guess is kind of fun, and looking at different ways to union and intersect the different geofence polygons in 2D space. We've simplified a little bit. We, you, know, you can have altitude layers, but we're assuming the floor and ceiling 
can be constant so that we don't have to deal with arbitrary concave polyhedra, which is a harder problem. So this is an example of Boston Common and the Esplanade. So in this case, we have a geofenced area that says, hey, if you're going to be flying over these parks, here's the only place you can go. Now, is it realistic? Maybe, maybe not. But it's a, it's a way that you could uh, um, you know, basically allow there to be drones in one area and not in another area um, because maybe you didn't want to fly over the buildings. Uh, another, uh, I think, compelling example, we did uh, the southern area of Manhattan, right, where we put a geofence over the river and we said drones can fly here, but they can't fly over the buildings on Manhattan or the Statue of Liberty, so you end up with cutouts and pretty complicated polygons that define the borders, right? So this is describing why we don't use circles and rectangles, right? It's more complicated than that. This is describing the complexity of altitude. If you live in a perfectly flat environment, this is not an issue, right? So in Michigan, who cares, right? But if you now go to Colorado and Utah and all of the places that have interesting terrain, then this is really a question that I don't think has been answered in the geofencing world or in general in this nice graphic that shows 400 and under is where you fly. Do you mean above ground or mean sea level altitude? It's not clear because there's, what you really want is you want there to be the floor of the geofenced area, you want it to be above ground level, and the ceiling you want to be mean sea level. Because the alternative is that the ceiling of your geofence follows the terrain, which is really complicated. Uh, there's also a distinction between whether your geofence goes all the way down to the ground or whether it doesn't. Right, so there may be what we're calling untethered cases where you actually couldn't land in that area because you don't have permission to go all the way down to the ground, whereas in other cases you do. So this is an example of how um, we've been layering the geofences. So the notion here is that there's three different boundaries. There's the original boundary, which is the no kidding, don't cross this boundary, you don't have permission kind of outer fence. And then the next boundary is the blue one, which is an override boundary. At that point, again, influenced by this override, if your pilot is flying you outside your geofence, then this will take over and do what's necessary. This is what DJI does right now. Now, I'm not saying it's doing exactly the right thing, but that is what it's doing. If you try to fly into the White House lawn, it will stop you and either cut power and land or go to a home waypoint. The third boundary is a warning boundary, which says, you probably want to warn the pilot that they're flying toward the edge of the geofence. So uh, my student who's been working on this has been focusing on the geometry. And it actually raises some interesting questions. So in the <coughs> middle of this red box, you see that the green boundary is no longer connected. And if you had a slightly different case, it could be that the blue boundary was not connected between the two bigger parts of the polygon either. So what this would imply is that if you wanted to fly, between those two large regions, even though you had a connected geofence, you would have to violate the warning boundary or the uh, override boundary to do that, which makes it um, interesting in terms of negotiating these geofences and thinking about the trade-offs between actually flying with them versus not. All right, so I think that's probably a good place to end, and I know the geofence content was cut short, but. Uh, it's just getting started, uh, and there's a lot of complicated questions in where airspace management is going with respect to incrementally changing what's there now versus really going, you know, I would call this part of a clean sheet approach, right, where you're really just asking the question, how do I do this in the best way possible to have safety but also maximize the ability for many vehicles with many missions to share the airspace. Thank you. All right, thank you.